welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome you to Grace today. So glad to see you here. Let's spread the love of Jesus Christ radically and without fear. Here all are welcome. Yes, you are welcome. To lift your hands and bless his holy name. Lay down your burden here at the altar. We welcome you to Grace Congregation. Oh, you're welcome at Grace Harlem. Find love at Grace Harlem. Spread peace at Grace Harlem. Find joy at Grace Harlem. Said you congregation Lord to the hungry and depressed the broken and confused find love forgiveness healing in this place let us help one another as we lift our hands in praise we welcome you to grace we welcome you to grace. We welcome you to grace. Amen. We welcome you to grace congregation. Oh, say you're welcome at grace. Harlem, find love at grace. Harlem, spread joy at grace. Harlem, find peace at grace. Harlem, say you're welcome here.
feet Hold my hand Precious Lord Take my hand And lead me home Take my hand Precious Lord, and lead me home. Amen. Lead me home. Take my hand, precious Lord. Amen. Amen. That's Andre. He's in Poland right now. And our singer is still in Tina, traveling around the world. So thank God they can still stay with us electronically. Amen. But I bring you to peace. We've been almost in a wellness program. Last week was joy, and this week is peace. And we certainly need peace this morning. I've got peace. John 16, verses 28 to 33. And the verse reads as such. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you're speaking clearly and without a figure of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you believe? Jesus replied. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have already overcome the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, as we bombard the heavens with our prayers and with our faith, pour down your Holy Spirit. Let us hear an unctioning of your word so that we may hear, thus saith the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have been in the book of John and chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. Help us to understand what Jesus was instructing his disciples as he was preparing to leave them, go to the cross, and ultimately leave them and go back to the Father. But he is telling them who he is, what he came for, and what he came to do, and what he accomplished. And so he does that in verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, because I've overcome the world. I've already overcome the world. And so he's telling you, I've given you the gospel message. These are the things that I've told you. I came to this world. I entered this world. And then I went back to the Father. And he's teaching us the message. Because there's two things he teaches us here about peace. Number one, if you believe in him, if you know who he is, you will have peace. Without Christ, there is no peace. It's a bold statement, but the statement he's making here is that without Christ, there is no peace. And the second thing is, you must act upon that belief. And so I only got two points this morning. Somebody say amen. Amen. Last week I had four. This week you only get two. Amen. But it says, I came from the Father and entered the world. And I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. This is interesting because he's telling us how to get peace. 
We all need peace in our life. We all want peace, con contentment, confidence, inward quietness. We all want groundedness. We all need peace. Somebody say amen. We need peace. We got to have peace in this world. And Jesus is saying, I'm giving you my peace. I'm giving you my peace. I told you these things. I gave you this teaching so that in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your trials and tribulations, you will have peace. And so this morning we hear from, from Jesus saying that he has come from the Father, entered this world, and he's leaving this world to go back to the Father. And so he's teaching them that he's not just handing them peace. He's not just pouring peace over their lives. He's giving him himself who is peace, who is the one who is peace. And so Christ is one who says, I give you peace that passes all understanding this morning. So I want you to have a peace this morning that doesn't come from this world, but it comes from God himself. And that is the peace that Jesus is offering us this morning because he is saying, I came from a divine place. I'm coming from heaven. I was with the Father. I left the Father to come to earth. I was on earth, and then I went back to the Father to sit at the right hand. In fact, if we go on next chapter, when we go to chapter 17, he'll say, I had glory with the Father before the earth was even created. I sat with glory with the Father before this earth was ever created. And so now he's leaving. He is choosing when he leaves and when he comes and when he goes. There's a certain voluntariness about this whole thing that Jesus chose to come. He didn't have to come. He chose to come and he chose to die and he chose to leave. And so what's interesting is the disciples said, well, now you're speaking clearly. I mean, now we understand all you're saying. I mean, it's finally, thank God, you're not talking in, in parables and crazy stories. You're just telling it plainly. Well, that's interesting because he's saying, I left heaven. I came to earth. I walked on this earth 33 years. I was crucified, died, resurrected, and then went back to heaven. He may be saying it plainly, but that was no easy feat. That was no easy thing to do, amen? And so we marvel at the understanding of what he was saying because he broke it down so simply and the disciples said, well, now we know what you're saying. You're speaking so plainly. But then on this, let me not get to that yet. Alexander McLaren was a uh, Baptist preacher. And in fact, his father went to Australia I don't know how long it took in the 1800s. I know it takes you 24 hours on a flight now, but back then it must have taken months to go from Glasgow, Scotland, where um, Alexander McLaren grew up as a Baptist minister's son, and his father went to Australia and came back. He spent three years working in Australia. But he, he's, an, he's an extraordinary person who has been able to extrapolate out of scripture some amazing thoughts. And what he wrote was, peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. Peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but having the presence of God in your life. Because he wrote this, there is nothing more plain than over and over, Jesus reiterates with a tremendous claim to have dealt that he was in the bosom of the Father long before he was in the bosom of Mary. And so he spoke and told us to the meekest, to the lowliest, to all of those that he was God, that he came from heaven and he went back to heaven and that he was God. And so this morning, you really have two choices. You either accept and believe what he's saying or you say, I reject that. He didn't leave us very room in between to say anything else because his claim was so bodacious, so clear that he was God. And Alexander McLaren says, you either accept all or reject it all. You can't be in between. You can't say, well, Jesus was a nice guy. You can't say he was a great teacher. You can't just say he was a love, a teacher of love. He was all that, but he was God. And you can't just take one. He said some things that many of us would never say. Love your enemy. He said, pray for your enemy. He said, the last will be first, and the first shall be last. 
I know we have books like Jesus is your CEO and servant leadership and all that, and that's all great stuff. But what I'm saying this morning is, is he your God? Is he your God? Because if you believe that, then the peace of God can come into your life. It is only the peace of God this morning. Because if you invoke the name of Jesus with not understanding who he is, you have wasted, you have not done that with integrity. And so this morning, you must know, he entered the world. Let me give you an example of that. One of my favorite writers is Dorothy Sayers. And she graduated, first woman to graduate Oxford. And she used to write mystery stories. And she wrote one story with Lord Peter Whimsey, an acrostatic sleuth. He was like a kind of a, a Sherlock Holmes kind of figure, but he, he wasn't making it. All of a sudden, a love interest shows up in her story named Harriet Vane, who comes in to save him. Harriet Vane, coincidentally enough, went to Oxford, the first woman to graduate. Harriet Bain, coincidentally enough, writes mystery stories about detectives. And so many scholars believe that she fell in love with her character and decided to put herself in the story to save her own character. She fell in love with her own character. I say that to say this. When God created us and put us in that beautiful, perfect place of Eden, and then we destroyed it and were kicked out shortly thereafter. Two brothers couldn't even get along and one kills the other. God couldn't take it anymore and he washed us from the face of this earth with a flood and started over with Noah. And then he said, you know what? I've sent you prophets, you didn't listen to them. I sent you my word, you didn't read it. I'm gonna send you my son. And so he decided in the story of love, to send his son to save us. It's a similar story to what Dorothy Sayers did in her book. And so when he saw that we were failing and flailing and couldn't make it on our own, he decided to bring himself into our own story. And so this morning he says, I'm going back to the Father. I'm going back. I'm leaving this world. I'm choosing to leave this world. As you remember, we talked about it, it was all voluntary. That Jesus said in chapter 15 of John, I, when he was, I'm, the good, I'm your good shepherd, he said, I'm laying my life down for my sheep. No man takes it from me. That he chose voluntarily to lay down his life, to be the sacrificial lamb, so that he could sacrifice himself for us. Right? It says there is no greater love than for a friend to lay down their life for you. There's no greater love than that. And yes, we talked about it, that you could say I'm laying down my life for a friend, but you only shortened your life, amen, because you were going to die anyway. You never really laid down your life. You shortened it, but you didn't lay it down. Only Jesus could legitimately say, I lay down my life for a friend because he voluntarily chose to give his life. And so with his soul in one hand and his body in the other, he handed it over so that it could be crucified and he could become the lamb of God, the sacrifice for us. And so he says, I'm going back to the Father. He dies on the cross for our sins and pays the price and goes back and he stands with the Father as our high advocate, as the one who is our high priest. And so when you get to heaven and you stand before the Father, as eloquently as my sister Janine will dress with all her beautiful colors, she will look magnificent because it's Jesus that God will see. All of his brilliance and his glory because it says you'll be covered in his blood, which is will make you as white as snow without blemish, sparkling, and he will see you as his own. And that's how we get back to the Father. It is Jesus who does that for us. He's our advocate. He is our high priest. He is the one who represents us. In the Bible, it says, any lawyer who has himself as a client has a fool for a client. If you represent yourself, 
We could never go before the Father without Jesus because we don't have what it takes. It says our, even our good stuff is rags in front of Jesus. And so the goodness, the commitment, the holiness, the glory that God sees when we stand before him is all the work of Jesus, all that he has done, the wisdom, the glory, and the love. And that's a gorgeous metaphor because if you've ever been respected by somebody who respects you, how wonderful that feels. If you've ever been adored by somebody who adores you, how wonderful does that feel? If you've ever been loved by somebody who loves you, how wonderful does that feel? And you are loved this morning because God loves you beyond imagination. Unconditionally, it says you can do nothing great that he can love you more. And guess what? You can't even do anything worse to make him love you less. That's how much you are loved this morning. There was an article in the New York Times talking about why doesn't Silicon Valley stop the harassment online? Why doesn't it stop the bullying online? All of this hatred in social media, racism, vitriolic, bombastic language online. And it seems like when people, because of the anonymity, the, all the guards are off. You can say whatever you want to say to one another. What was beautiful about this article, it says the problem is not social media, not technology. The problem is in the heart of our human beings. Microsoft created a 17-year-old AI, gave her her own social media account, and said, go to it. She learned everything 17-year-olds say. In 16 hours, they had to shut it down. She was so cruel and mean. AI. You think this world will get better with AI? No, because it'll learn the worst from us. And so the truth of the matter is, we need a new heart. And the only way to get that wickedness out of our heart is to have a transplant with Jesus. That's the only transplant that will help us this morning to get a new heart. We will not have peace without it. The wickedness is there. When Mother Teresa said there's a Hitler in all of us, I thought, ooh, that's a little bit much. Well, when I thought about it, if all of us had the same conditions, we might be a Hitler because the wickedness is in our heart already. And so I want you to have peace this morning and to know there's the possibility of peace because Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace in this world and you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome this world. So let's talk about how we have peace this morning. Because he said, I come from the Father, I, I was here and I went back, but I came to show you peace. And he's saying this morning, because they say, you're speaking plainly now. And Jesus says, do you really believe? Do you really believe now? Jesus is being ironic. You don't really believe. Because if you did believe, you wouldn't be running away, scattering, going back to your own homes, and, being, and leaving me alone. Because a lot of us say, I believe. But let there be trial and tribulation and trouble in your life. And then we'll really find out what you truly believe. It is only when trials and tribulations come along do we know what anyone believes. Because what do you reach for when you're in trouble? What do you need when you're in trouble? What are you looking for when you're in trouble? Because here it is, Jesus says, you're gonna betray me, you're gonna leave me, you're gonna deny me. You don't believe yet. If you believed, you would not have done those things. And so this morning, how do you believe? Because if they did believe, they wouldn't be afraid of, of being persecuted or being executed or being anything because they would know, death, where is thy sting? Death, where is thy victory? Because if you're with someone who is going, came from the Father, going back to the Father, it says I'm either with Christ alive or with Christ dead. It doesn't matter. I'm with Christ. Why, is you, why are you fearing anything in this world? And yet they were ready to run and hide because they believed intellectually it hadn't penetrated their hearts. It hadn't penetrated their lives. And so to penetrate your life, your heart, your spirit, and your soul, I love what he says, in this world you will have trouble, 
take heart. And so when the, the night comes, the dark night of the soul comes, and those stormy days come, for most of us, you will not know you need God until you have nothing left. Nothing else. I remember when I first became pastor of this church, going through divorce, mom and dad were dying, losing business, losing my family. It wasn't until that moment that I realized the only thing that I've ever had was Jesus. I had nothing else. Nothing else to hold on to. Nothing else that was a foundational thing that I could say I could stand on this. It was all gone. This church, or like crucify him, crucify him. Some of you remember that time. They were having meetings about how they're gonna get rid of their pastor. That was my life. And yet I found peace in the midst of that. Many of us won't find peace until trouble finds us and we realize Jesus is the only thing I ever had. The only thing I could hold on to, right? Because your spirituality is like a muscle. If you were to sit down all day, lie down all week long, it'd be hard for you to get up at the end of the week because you didn't use your muscles. Your spirituality is the same way. If you're not exercising, if you're not practicing it, if you're not getting through things with it, it's dying. It's getting weaker by the minute. I recently came across a book, Knowing God, J.I. Packard. It's a beautiful book. And I, I, I talk to new Christians about it all the time. And he took a song out of John Newton's, uh, who wrote Amazing Grace. But he took a song that said in the seventh verse, and there's a chapter in there called The Inward Trials. And it says this, these inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break the schemes of earthly joy that thou may find thou all in me. If I could break away from the joys of this earth, which are faulty, and find the joy of you in me, of Jesus Christ inside of me, that's joy. That's peace that I will have, that I can hold on to. And this is so important in this day and age because Jesus says you will have trouble in your heart. And some people, some people want to translate that and say, be of good cheer. But can I tell you that's not gonna help you? I haven't wanted to get a tattoo before, but I found something that I might wanna have to tattoo on. Here it is. Jesus is saying, dare to believe. He is saying, I dare you to believe. I dare you to believe. He says, I've overcome the world. I dare you to believe that. I dare you to believe that this morning. Because if you step out on faith and live as though the gospel is truly true, you're unstoppable. You're unstoppable. I dare you this morning to live that way. I dare you to believe that all this is true. In fact, Paul says, but God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. He is employing a military term, because when you go out to fight, you used to boast about your biggest artillery, your biggest weaponry, how many men you have, how many things you've got, and how you were gonna win this war with the best archers and all of that. And he's saying, you wanna win life? What are you boasting about? What's your greatest weaponry? What's your greatest tool to fight what you have to fight in, your, in this world? And guess what Paul is saying? God forbid that I should boast in anything else but the cross. That's my artillery, that's my secret weapon, is Christ the cross. And what he did on the cross for me demonstrates the love 
And so I say to you, with that kind of love, what could scare you? What could bother you? What could steal your joy? What could take away your peace if Christ is with you and Christ loves you that amount of money, that amount, that tremendous amount? What could scare you this morning? What could take you away from the things? I know this morning some of you boast about status. We met somebody just yesterday. They were telling us all their history, all the things they did. All you know, I'm always suspect when you meet somebody and they got to tell you all their titles and all the this and all of that. And I'm like, okay, but who are you? Who are you? Because I, after all the titles, who are you really? After a world has called you all kinds of names, who are you really? What are you really? And so when Paul is boasting, I can call and say, I'm a child of the living God. And that never changes. That never changes. So no matter what you're going to, what, no matter what titles the world wants to give you, even if they want to give you speak of the house and then take it away nine months later, guess what? I'm still a child of God. You want to call me anything but a child of God? You can't because I know who I am. And that doesn't change. And so when we wear labels and, and have things that identify who we are, all that can wither away, they can rust away, and they can die. Guess who I was hanging out with? It can change in a minute. The only thing that can give us the peace that we need is Christ. And so you want to be a colossal failure? Try to please everybody all the time. Try that. You'll be a colossal failure. Because you can't. I can't even please this congregation in five minutes. Amen? So you can't do that. You just got to be who you are by the grace of God and hope they accept you and don't fire you. Amen? Because that's what life is. And that's where the peace is. The peace is understanding that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And therefore, nothing can be moved. Nothing can be changed. You can't take my peace away because you didn't give it to me. And therefore, the world didn't give it to me either. And it can't take it away. And so there's confidence there. The greatness of love. The overflowing beauty that you feel. Because I love what Paul says. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trial, shall tribulation, shall persecution? Nay, I say in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Because there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. So this morning, who are you? And when Christ says, you are my own child, and I love you just the way you are, you ought to walk out of here with your head up and your chest out and knowing that you have the peace of Christ within you, regardless of what's going around in your world this morning. You ought to feel that power surge that I know who I am this morning. I'm able to go out there and feel the earth beneath my feet in a very different way because I know whose I am this morning. Because if you've got economic problems, the money is funny, money is low, I can reach into my daddy's rich bank account and say, guess what? I've got the richness of Christ in my life. And there's nothing compares to that. Amen. If you're going through relationship problems, I've got the best relationship in the world. I got somebody who loves me, with all my blemishes, with all the things that I've done, with all the things I've halted, he still loves me. And that makes a very different person. Because when you come into a relationship, you don't need love. You already have love. You're able to give love. And even when that person's not loving you on that day, I'm still loved. I'm still loved. That's a very different relationship. Right? When your identity is based on Christ, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it doesn't change. My identity wasn't based on being a banker or a pastor because those things change. How many people lose their jobs and they've lost their identity because it was all wrapped up in one? That's not who you are. You're much greater than that. And so this morning, take heart when you're in trouble because it's peace Christ that's being transferred over to you. You heard the song by Tommy Dorsey earlier, and we've learned the history of that song. 
And the beauty of that song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, right? He was on the road, and what happened was his wife, who was pregnant, was sick. And he, they said, rush home immediately. And before he got home, his infant and his, his wife had died. And he wrote that song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, Lead Me On. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm alone. But lead me to the light. Take me, precious Lord, lead me home. Because when you're in your dark space, you need somebody to take you to the light. But let me give you another story. Horatio Spotford, he was a lawyer in, in America in the 1800s. He sent his four daughters and his wife, he was supposed to go to, on a vacation in Europe and he had to stay behind to to finish some work on a, on a case he was working on. And on the way over, the ship sunk. And he got telegraphed that his four daughters were lost. They found his wife holding onto a piece of the ship in the middle of the sea. He flew over to Europe, got his wife, and came back. And he wrote a song. Many of you know it, let me put it up there, but it goes like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like a sea billows and rolls, whatever my lot thou hast cast me to say, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. I dare you to believe. In the midst of your trial and your tribulation, you still can say, it is well with my soul. Mom had this song, that song at her funeral. And I don't even know if my sisters realized it, but there was a typo at the end. It said, it is well with my son. And I knew that was from mom. Because the Catholic church, church can certainly spell soul. It said at the end of the program, you go home and look at it, it is well with my son. That's peace. When you've got Christ in your life, that's peace. The blessed assurance that God is with you no matter what. That is peace. And so I dare you this morning to believe in the peace of Christ that you walk with that out of here. Because God said this, but the wicked are storm-battered seas that can't quiet down. The waves stir up garbage and mud. There is no peace, God said, for the wicked. There's no peace. You think all those folks that are, you know, famous and wealthy and on TV, you think they got peace? They got less peace because garbage and mud is always being flung up. Unless you're foundationally grounded in Christ, you will have no peace in your life. You need Christ in your life. And let me just close with this. Because Jesus for a moment had to go without peace. He had to scream from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? While he took our sins, the father had to turn his back on, on, on Jesus. And so he understood what having no peace feels like. And that's why he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. I know what it's like to have no peace. Have the father turn his back on you and yet still know God loves you. Can you imagine you going through trials and tribulations when I was going through mine? And I still said, God loves you. I remember mom came here one time and she heard me preach and she's like, I don't know how you preach like that because if people really knew what was going on in your life, I don't know how you could say those things. How do you still have faith? She was questioning how I still could st stand from this pulpit and preach love when I wasn't feeling much love in my life. You can only do that when Christ is within you. You can only do that when the love of God is with you.
Because when I know what Christ did for me, it's not what I did. It's what he did. It's love. So I dare you to believe this morning, it's what got Horatio Spotford through, it's what got Tommy Dorsey through life, and still be able to produce beautiful music and beautiful songs. To tell you this, that Jesus loves you, that you are loved beyond imagination, to let you know that there is an inner peace like a river, that peace that passes all understanding, to let you know there's nothing in this world that will give you peace, there is nothing in this world that can give you the peace of Christ. And so this morning, thank God for the peace that we have. Memorize it, meditate on it, but most of all, believe that you have peace in this world. You will never get it, but with Christ, you will have it for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. this moment with gratitude in our hearts for all that you have done for us and how can we repay you when you have given us everything and sacrificed all for us 
And so, Lord God, it is only with a heart of thanksgiving that we give back to you. And so, God bless you. God bless you in your giving. Amen. I just want to thank you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and Jesus for bless